Hello everyone, Kanasa here, and welcome back to Coming Home Redux, and welcome to the construction of the EVE fleet. The EVE class vessel, or the EVE class interplanetary vessel, I probably should say, is our second generation of interplanetary ship using the Verne pulsed fission engine from Far Future Technologies. In this episode, we are going to be creating another two of them to bring our grand total up to three. And to be honest, three is going to be more than enough to be going interplanetary to pretty much every destination in the Tempest system. These vessels are great. The ones that we will be producing in this episode, the first of which can be seen on screen now, well, they are going to be going to Fury and Vasto, the closest planet to the Tempest system barycenter and the furthest from the Tempest system center. So, if these achieve their mission successfully, then we know that we can go to every single planetary body in this system without fail. And I would like to say at the beginning of this episode, I put the names for these down to a vote over on the community section of my channel recently. And you people did vote. And the results were overwhelmingly in favor of one option. And well, no, this, this one option, the option that won, got over 50% of the votes, over 500 votes. And that was to name these two new vessels Venus and Aphrodite. And I think that's quite fitting personally, because obviously these are the EVE class of vessels named after the planet EVE in stock KSP. EVE's in real life counterpart is Venus. Yes. And Venus's Greek counterpart is Aphrodite. So I think this is a very fitting naming convention for these two vessels and apparently so did all of you and that's what they shall be known as what we are going to be doing now in the episode though is filling these up with fission pellets so the first of these vessels the rsas eve we only had two tanks for fission pellets on that and that got us about nine to ten thousand meters per second of delta v with a fully fueled manta spacecraft on the side i have since upgraded that to four fission pellet tanks. That's right, we have doubled it. And with that, we are able to get about 17 to 18,000 meters per second of Delta V in orbit with one of these interplanetary vessels. However, that does mean we have two more fission pellet tanks to actually fill up, which is a pain. And if you saw previous episodes in this series, it took me about 300 days to a year in order to fill up two which was also pain. However, with the new infrastructure in place on Armstrong, we can produce enough fission pellets to fill up one of the newer models in about 20 days, just slightly under 20 days. The new enriched uranium facilities on Aldrin base are so good that we can do it incredibly fast. And that is going to make building these interplanetary vessels much, much nicer Fueling them up is going to take a lot less time. They'll be a lot more useful this way, I feel. It was something, obviously, that I wanted to do, was upgrade my enriched uranium facilities, because I'm using that resource for absolutely everything. I'm using it for fuel, I'm using it for power. So the fact that we can now produce absolutely chonking loads of it is going to be great for this series all round, because we also do need that fuel for things like nuclear salt water, which is definitely something that we will be looking into later on in this series. We are going to try and avoid firing one of those around road though, because we do not want to irradiate the <laughs> all of space around around road. I was told that basically a nuclear salt water rocket is <laughs> is basically trying to cause the Chernobyl incident. It, it, it gives off that much radiation and, and bad stuff essentially so we want to be careful when we use one of those but they will be a little while in the future anyway we were able to fully fuel up the rsas venus obviously the first of those will be the venus the second one that we produce in this episode will be the aphrodite and with that being done we are going to come along to aldrin base to build our first module on the surface Yes, we've got some sort of magical 3D printer down on the surface now and we are able to build on site, which is great. No, I, you'd like to think it's some sort of wizardish 3D printer, but actually it's just a stake stuck into the ground, hit down with a mallet that Alexander Kerman placed there. I think it might have been even the last episode. 
And with that being done, we were able to build stuff. And that's what we have done. We've built this rather janky contraption with wheels because we're on the ground. So I thought, well, rather than building engines to move this around, why not just use wheels? And the reason why we don't use wheels is because Armstrong has such a low surface gravity that it is a friggin' nightmare to drive anything around with wheels. This is all sped up to like four times speed in post and five times physical time warps. This is like 20 times regular speed and look how slow we're going. And it's just, it's just really painful, really painful. And you can obviously see my attempts at parallel parking there were not that great. But we were able to get it close enough for Alexander Kerman to come out, deconstruct absolutely everything, and connect the two modules together. So, originally I was going to keep these all in a straight line, because I thought that would be kind of nice. But when I set down the enriched uranium containment facility, or the transport facility, in the last episode, I actually thought a little bit of a crook in it looked right too. But that being said, the flexor tubes. Someone left a comment. They do look janky. They do look very janky. This base will be using them, because that's how I've set it up now. Future surface bases, we are going to be moving away from those. But anyway, with that new module, what it was able to produce was silicon, chemicals, and polymers. So we now have a lot of silicon, chemicals, and polymers being produced on site, and that is enough to produce specialized parts, material kits, and machinery and keep that completely self-sufficient. Yes, we have a self-sufficient base down on the surface of Armstrong that will forever produce those materials as long as I keep going around the miners and pumping the raw resources into that base. It's great. The only thing that is not self-sufficient about that base at the moment is the Kerbals. But we, we don't really care about them, do we? I'm, I'm not... Uh... Maybe we should. No, we will We will obviously try and make our Kerbals self-sufficient as well at a later date, and that'll be something that we do work on in the coming episodes. But now, what we have been doing, we were in the vehicle assembly building very briefly, whilst I was going off on one about Kerbals, apparently. And what we were making is this logistics module that we are going to stick onto the end of Collins Station. Essentially, there is a way using, I believe, USI, where you can take resources from one craft and magically transport it to another. I say magically, but you do need resources. You need material kit, specialized parts. No, material kit, liquid fuel, and oxidizer in order to produce something called transport credits, which you then use to basically buy rides to different locations. And that's what this window that I've got up now. And we can see at the bottom, it has a total cost. Currently, that's 1,245. That's 1,245 transport credits, and that's what we are producing now. You can see that number going up rather rapidly above the governor slider on that MKS Tundra Pioneer and Logistics Module part action window. Yes, yeah, so now we have 1,435 that we did, of, as I have said, use liquid fuel, oxidizer, and material kits to produce. But with that being done, I was able to transport 10,000 material kits and 2,000 specialized parts up to Collins Station at the click of a button. And you know what is also fabulous? We can do more than that. We can send enriched uranium. We can send liquid fuel. We can send oxidizer. We can send absolutely everything that we are gonna be creating on the surface of Ultron base up to Collins Station to be used there at the click of a button. I don't have to launch spacecraft from Armstrong anymore. I don't have to worry about faffing about with docking and rendezvousing and all of that. No, I can just press a button and it will be done. And that means that this series is going to be much, much nicer to produce. <laughs> I got a little bit carried away there. I am terribly sorry. But no, it will be a lot nicer because the click of a button and all of that stuff gets taken. I don't have to faff around with moving the parts for fish and pellet production anymore. I can just move them and fish and pellets will be being produced constantly. It's great. It means we can get even more into planetary vessels if we so want to. And speaking of that, I'm in the vehicle assembly building again. We're working in the all-in-one scanner. I'm going to be going to Fury. And this is a planet that I have not actually scanned yet, because obviously being so close to the Tempest system, you need a lot of Delta V to slow down, and I've not really had any crafts capable of doing that until we've got these new machines. So what I am going to do is I did notice on the RSAS Venus, there was a free docking port. And that's what I wanted to put on here. I wanted to put two of these all-in-one scanners. One of them will go around Fury, the other will go around Anger, which is the moon of Fury. Anger is probably the one that we are going to be harvesting resources from or absolutely 
decimating that moon of its natural resources. Yes, because Fury is going to be very difficult to land on. I think the orbital velocity around Fury is something like 5,600 meters per second. It's more than road. So we need big spacecraft to get to and from the surface of that. And at the same time, the atmosphere, I believe, is much thicker. So it's going to be difficult to land on Fury. It will be something that we do try and send Kerbals down to at some point. But not at the moment. We need better technology in order to do that. What we will do, though, is probably look to Anger, because that has all of the resources that we could ever possibly want. And of course, we will focus on going there at a future point. But for now, we have constructed the RSAS Aphrodite. And this will be the last of the RSAS EVE class interplanetary vessels, because once having built this, we will be unlocking, hopefully, some tasty new engines. Also, fusion engines. They are getting very close to being unlocked now, and I feel like the next generation of interplanetary vessels, or, or Generation 3, may even use fusion engines, which will be very, very tasty. One thing I want to say about this vessel as well, and actually, this, this moment in this episode, I'm going a little bit more cinematic here. Obviously, there is no heads-up display. Obviously, the, I'm using the pathing camera to get some nice views. But yes, that is one thing that I might do. I used to obviously do cinematics for Kerbal Gets Real the next millennia, I'm not going to go overblown on them on this series, but it is something that I've wanted to get back into doing because it does look very nice. They're very pretty. They make you go, ooh, and ah, you know, <laughs> rather than me just having the heads up display up the entire time. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to go overboard though, because one thing about this series is I did always want it to be easy to make, easy to edit, so I can get lots of episodes out. You can have constant content coming out. So I'm not going to go overboard because that does mean I'll have to spend a lot more time editing and a lot more time filming. But yeah, it's just something that I think we will start introducing to the series. So I hope you do enjoy that. But anyway, we are now plotting out our maneuver to Vasto. And with that being done, that'll be the end of this episode. I have been Kanasa, and I will see you later.